the first successful model describing the behavior of the hydrogen atom was the one proposed by Niels Bohr. It's called the Bohr model. Niels Bohr is widely regarded as the second most important physicist of the 20th century, right after Albert Einstein. He was one of the founding fathers of modern quantum mechanics. But before the birth of modern quantum mechanics, the Bohr model, which belonged to what's called old quantum theory, he proposed in 1913, gave us uh, very much insight into the hydrogen atom. In fact, we're going to study the Bohr model from now on. The Bohr model confronted the, uh, the uh, uh, shortcomings of the uh, previous models for the hydrogen atom before that. And it was able to give us a correct understanding of what's going on inside the hydrogen atom and numerically it gave us the correct energy spectrum or we say uh, frequency spectrum of the light coming out of the hydrogen atom so it enjoyed great success let's see what are the key points of the Bohr model first of all because of the Rutherford experiment in a Bohr model you don't have this uh, uniform distribution of positive charges anymore as in a plum pudding model rather you have electrons going around nucleus, which is, which is very small. So you have a nucleus here, the electron going around it, in circular orbitals, okay, in circular orbitals. And these orbitals, here I drew one orbital, here I drew another, and the distance here is r sub n, the distance there is r sub n plus 1. The electron can be in any one of these orbitals, and the further away from nucleus, the greater the energy of this electron, because remember the force is attractive, so it corresponds to a negative potential. And uh, in the old models for the uh, hydrogen atom, we always had this one problem, and that was the atom was not stable, okay, because the electrons will radiate energy away as they accelerate in, uh, in uh, uh, classical electricity and in, in, in magnetism. Any particle, any charged particle that undergoes acceleration will inevitably lose energy through radiation. This electron moving in a circle, of course, has acceleration, and therefore it will be losing energy, and so it won't be stable. In which the, 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 the orbital will then decay as the electron loses energy, get closer and closer and closer, eventually spiral into the nucleus and kill itself. Bohr says this contradicts with the fact that the atom is actually stable. So he says we must propose what's called stationary orbit. In other words, as the electron moves in a given orbit, given circular orbit, it never releases any energy. It does not, therefore, decay into uh, the center of the atom, the nucleus. It does not crash on the nucleus because it does not lose any energy. Okay, the uh, the energy is com is is constant, and therefore the orbital is station is, is 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 stable. We call it stationary orbits. But how do you explain the light coming from the uh, the hydrogen atom? We well, says the electron will lose energy if it goes from one orbital to a, another orbital with lower energy. That it can do. So, for example, if the electron starts from here and it, it goes downwards to the nearest lower orbital like this, make a transition going down, it will, sh it will then lose some energy, right? According to the conservation of energy, this energy has to be somewhere. And in fact, according to Bohr, this energy becomes the energy of a photon coming out. And therefore, we can write E at n plus 1, which is the energy here, minus E at n. That must equal to hf. That's the, that tells you the frequency of the light coming from this uh, transition of electronic orbital. I'm assuming that it went from one orbital to its immediate neighbor. It doesn't have to be the case. It can go from n equal, n equal to 5 to n equal to 2, for example. So it doesn't have to be right next to another. But that's, that's the idea. And why is the energy of the photon equal to h times f? That is from the uh, um, blackwater radiation Planck's hypothesis. Okay, so this Bohr model in fact incorporated a lot of the successes of the uh, previous uh, uh, study of the quantum physics, you know, the quantum hypothesis of, of the photon energy and uh, the Rutherford experiment. So that's energy transition. Now we do know that the, uh, the light, we can write this as hc over lambda, we do know that the wavelengths coming from the hydrogen atom cannot be just any value. It has a discrete set of values sa satisfying the Rydberg, the Rydberg formula. And because of that, you have to assume that the energies 
Okay, the energies of that electron in different orbitals must also have discrete values. Cannot have just any value. And this, of course, is the quantization of energy of the electrons in the hydrogen atom. And Bohr compared his theoretical calculation with the experimental finding, which is the Rydberg form. And he found that in order to match the theory with the experiment, there has to be a key hypothesis, key hypothesis, and that is the called quantization of the angular moment. What does that mean? This is at the, at the centerpiece of the Bohr model. Okay, so I'm going gonna, gonna to box that. It says that, take this orbital for example. This orbital has um, has a radius of Rn. If the mass of the electron is m, then its momentum is m times vn, right? vn being the speed. And if I multiply this bar R by Rn, what do I get? I get the magnitude of the angular momentum of this electron in this particular orbital. That's 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 what it is. That's you know that's cross specific, right? But according to Bohr, this angular momentum cannot assume just any value. It must be a multiple of h bar. H bar is h over two pi. This is the quantization of angular momentum. You must have that, otherwise the theory of the Bohr model will not agree with the experiment. So how did Bohr get that? We can call it reverse engineering. So basically, he, he had this theory, and he said, OK, I have this experimental result. How do I match these two? It turns out you have to have this. Otherwise, it doesn't match. And uh, let's see how will uh, you know, these, uh, these uh, hypotheses, these assumptions by Bohr, lead to a correct match between theory and experiment. We're, we're going to begin this by calculating the energy, the allowed energy levels of an electron in the hydrogen atom. OK, so we have here um, a nucleus, positive charge, with one electronic charge, positive E. And here's the electron with negative E. It goes around it with a radius R. And the speed is V. The force of attraction between the electron and the, um, the proton is F. Now, F, E, means electron. Uh, is electric force, okay, not gravitational force. We can ignore gravitational force. It's much less than that. Ke squared over R squared. That's, of course, Coulomb force. This Coulomb force points to the center of the circular motion. Therefore, it acts as what? The centripetal force, right? Which is mv squared over R from physics 1a. And this formula belongs to physics 1a, n1c. Okay, so we just equate the Coulomb force with centripetal force. There is no quantum mechanics in it. Where does the quantum mechanics come in? The next one. It says the angular momentum of this electron cannot just be any value. Its magnitude, which is, which is equal to mvr, has to be a multiple of h bar. h bar is h over 2 pi. n is a quantum number, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. I have, therefore, two equations. Okay. Here's the first one. Here's the second one. I have two unknowns. There's r, the radius, and there's v, the speed. Given two equations, two unknowns, I can find them, right? So here is the result after you do some algebra. In fact, all you have to do is uh, uh, you, uh, you you know, square both sides of this equation, you get v squared, and that solve for that v squared, plug into here, you replace that, v squared, so you only have r, you solve for r, you get this. Once you get r, you plug back in, you get v. Okay, so you get this r, this v. It turns out that uh, the allowed radii of an electronic orbit are not arbitrary. It must be some sort of constant value times n squared. This n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and, and so on. Okay, And this constant is the value of the radius when n equal to 1. So it's the, it's the, it's the radius of the low, uh, it's basically the shortest radius when the electron is closest to the, the hydrogen nucleus. And this radius is called the first Bohr radius. The, we call it A0 in our textbook, the symbol. It's equal to h bar squared of, over mke squared. And then also the speed. It turns out the speed is also quantized, cannot just be anything. And the speed is equal to ke squared over h bar squared, then divided by n. The further an electron is away, the greater its radius of the orbital, but the slower it moves. The slower it moves. This is not, this is nothing new, okay? Even in classical physics, when you look at a planet going around the sun, 
the further a planet is away from the sun, the slower it moves, not the faster it moves. So that that agrees with classical physics qualitatively. Given R and V n, we can then find the energy of this electron moving around the proton. It's made of two parts: the kinetic part and the potential part. The kinetic part is m v squared over two. The potential part is negative k e squared over r. Okay? And you plug in a value of possible v's here, possible r's here. You combine these two terms, and this is what you get. Negative m k squared e to the power of four over two h bar squared n squared. Numerically, that sounds like a pretty challenging thing to do. I mean, you can try to calculate it. You get very, very small numbers, raised to the power of four and raised to the power of two and whatever. We'll see how we can do that. Okay, but at least we did calculate the uh, energy of the uh, of the uh, electrons going around, and it turns out this energy indeed is quantized. It all comes from the quantization of angular momentum. And uh, by the way, the kinetic and potential energy of this electron, these two values are related. Okay, they are related. Why? Because again, we start with this, the first equation here. Coulomb force equals to centripetal force. We cross one power of r, and we get mv squared, r is gone. Okay, and that time becomes ke squared over r to the first power. And you notice that this really is the negative value of the potential energy, right? The potential energy is negative ke squared over r. So here it is twice as much as the kinetic energy. Here it is the absolute value of the potential energy. So 2k equals absolute value of u, which equals negative u because u itself is negative. So therefore, you can write k, you can write the total energy, not necessarily as a sum of the potential and kinetic energy, but rather as kinetic or potential energy alone. If you write it only in terms of kinetic energy, then you replace u with what? With, uh, with negative 2k. Okay, u is equal to negative 2k, so it's k minus 2k, so that's negative 1 half of u squared. The total energy is less than zero, which makes sense because the particle is trapped here. It cannot go to infinity. It's negative 1 half of u squared. Or you can replace, get rid of k in favor of u. And if you did that, k is a negative u over 2. So negative u over 2 plus another u, that's u over 2. So the energy can also be written as negative k squared over 2r. That's how you combine potential and kinetic energy up. This is classical stuff, which is valid here as well. Nothing new here. So now let's take a look at how we can find the energy, the uh, frequency of the photon, the size and the speed of the electron, uh, the size of the orbital and the speed of the electron in a, in a Bohr model numerically without too much of a struggle. The formulas that we got before look pretty complicated. You know, there's the energy of the electron, and here's the, the, the Bohr radius, and here is its speed. It may take a lot of effort if you try to put in the SI unit value for K, for E, for H bar, and that sort of thing to calculate the numerical value. Are there better ways for us to organize these, unit, these uh, results? It is, the answer is definitely yes. We do two things. One is to use the combinations such as H bar, C, H, C, and so on, as we did before numerous times. And the other is we introduce a, an ever so important constant called the fine structure constant. The fine structure constant. Here is the definition of the fine structure constant. We call it alpha. It is defined as Ke squared over h bar c. What is the unit of alpha? Well, let's see here. Ke squared. What is the unit of Ke squared? Well, we do know that if you divide Ke squared by r, the radius, you will get what? The expression for the potential energy, right? Don't worry about negative sign, just unit. And therefore, uh, k squared over r has a unit of energy. So k squared has a unit of energy times length. That's joule times meter. In fact, you plug in k equals 8.99 times 10 to the 9. E equals 1.6 times to negative 19. You can k e squared in joule times meter. Convert joule to ev and m to nanometers. You can get the expression of k e squared in ev nanometers. You did that. If you did that, you will get 1.44 eV nanometers. This is yet another important combination of fundamental constants. Please, again, keep this in heart, and you will find it very useful. Now, what about h bar c? h bar c is equal to 197 eV nanometers. So you see the numerator and the denominator happen to have the same exact units, and therefore alpha is just a dimensionless constant. What is it equal to? Well, let's see here. 197 denominator, 1.44 numerator, 
So you take de denominator divided by numerator, the numerator turns equal to turns out to be one, and then alpha is roughly equal to one over 137. So it is a little bit less than one percent. Okay, given the expression for alpha, it turns out we can rewrite the speed of the electron in the nth Bohr orbital as a very simple expression, alpha times c over n. Now c is the speed of light, so what's alpha times c? That is the uh, fraction of the, uh, of the speed compared with the speed of light. Alpha equals v over c, okay? So alpha times c is a little bit less than 1% of the speed of light, and you divide it by n. n is uh, the quantum number 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So you know the fastest speed of an electron in the Bohr model is alpha times c over 1, right? That's the, the, gr the ground state with the highest speed. And even that highest speed, how does that v compare with c? Well, the ratio is alpha, v over c is alpha, and alpha is less than 1%. So that justifies the f the, the, our approximation of using 1 half mv squared for the kinetic energy. We use 1 half mv squared for the kinetic energy. That is a rel non-relativistic expression. We did not use relativity to do that. And turns out that is not a bad approximation at all because even the highest speed of this electron is still less than 1% of the speed of light. Now, I want to show you that this expression, when you plug into one ne negative 1 half mv squared, you get the total energy as before. You see, alpha, first of all, alpha c over n indeed gives us the speed. Alpha is ke squared over h bar c times c over n, that's ke squared over h bar n, and that is the expression for Vn, as we got before, right, by solving these two equations. And um, you can also find, from this Vn, you can also find uh, Rn, okay, the, uh, the, uh, the radius of the n's Bohr orbital. There are a couple of things you can do to get that, to relate R Rn with Vn. One is to use Engel momentum, mvr equals nh bar, or you can go through energy to do that. The absolute value of the potential energy, k squared over r, equals twice the kinetic energy value. We saw that before. The kinetic energy equals 1 half mv squared, so that's twice as that. Okay, Vn equals alpha c over n. From here, you can easily find Rn to be equal to a constant times n squared, and that constant, according to this simple analysis, equals h bar squared over mk e squared. That is consistent with what we got here, okay? h bar squared over mk e squared. But numerically, what is this? What is the value of the Bohr radius, the first Bohr radius? Well, the trick is the same. We multiply numerator and denominator by the same constant of what? c squared, okay? So this becomes h bar c squared. m becomes mc squared, and then ke squared. We've got three constants here, h bar c, mc squared for the electron, and ke squared. We know all of these three by heart, don't we? The 197 eV nanometers divided by 511 keV divided by 1.44 eV nanometer, that's a new one right here. And the answer is 0 0.2, 0 0.0259 nanometers. Now, before nanometer technology became very, um, uh, very fashionable, we often used a different units to refer to the size of atoms. We, we, we used what's called angstrom. An angstrom is defined as 10 to the negative 10 meters, a nanometer is 10 to the negative nine meters. So we can rewrite this as roughly 0.53 angstroms instead of 0.053 nanometers. So the radius of the first Bohr orbital is about half an angstrom, which means the diameter of the hydrogen atom in the ground state is roughly one angstrom. That's a very simple thing to remember. Okay, about one-tenth of a nanometer or one angstrom. So we have, uh, given the uh, value for alpha, we can find both the expression and the expression and the numerical values V and R very easily, but what about energy? Okay, so let's look at energy. How do we express energy very easily? Well, let's find the energy eigenvalues. First of all, we express the energy in terms of the kinetic energy alone, negative one half mv squared. V is equal to alpha c over n as before. Okay, so that's that. Now, you can break alpha equals k e squared over h bar c, which is, you're just gonna go ahead and you know, get the original expression for k, uh, for, for en, which is, uh, which is right here. But we want an easier way out when it comes to numerical calculation, so we're gonna keep alpha as, as is, just alpha, one over 137. Okay, 
I just multiply alpha squared c squared out, there is n squared. This whole combination is the value of e when n equals 1, right? This whole combination. The combination is m alpha squared c squared over 2. That is e1. I took an absolute value here by taking the negative outside. e1 is the absolute value of the ground state energy. Okay, what is e1 numerically? With our expression, it's much easier than before. One half mc squared alpha squared. mc squared is 511 keV. Alpha, again, 1 over 137 squared. See how simple that is? The answer is 13.6 eV. Okay, so the ground state energy of this electron in a Bohr model for the hydrogen atom is negative 13.6 eV. Keep that in mind. It's a good thing to know. The energy level transitions. Now, we cannot measure the energy levels directly, but we can measure the energy of the photon coming out when an electron jumps from one orbital to another. So suppose the electron makes a jump from uh, the orbital labeled with quantum number n to an orbital labeled with quantum number m. So clearly, if, you, if it jumps down, then m must be less than n. Okay, So n is greater than m. Here is the formula for the photon frequency or the photon wavelength according to the energy difference. The energy of the photon equals to the energy lost by this electron as it makes its orbital jump. We plug in the values of En and Em from here. Okay, so we have m squared, n squared. And then you move that hc to that side, you're left with 1 over lambda equals something constant times m squared minus n squared. So 1 over m squared minus 1 over n squared. And you know, this is quite familiar. We actually saw that in the beginning of this lecture. That is the Rydberg formula, okay? It was discovered by Rydberg 1888. It was a purely empirical formula. There was no theoretical background. We just found that this formula somehow matches experimental value very well. But now we have a theoretical basis for that formula. And this formula is exactly the same as ours, except we have to test. Is it true that m squared c over 2h is it really equal to Rh, the Rydberg constant? The Rydberg constant equals 1.097 times 10 to the 7 per meter, according to experiment. It matches with the, uh, the light frequencies. Then you're going to get that. But I have a theoretical formula for the Rydberg constant. And here it is. mc squared, again, multiply both numerator and denominator by c this time. So we get mc squared and hc. Okay, Make it easy. mc squared, alpha squared, over 2 over hc. Actually, 2 hc. Let me leave the 2 here. And then this is mc squared, this is alpha, 1 over 137 squared, and then there's a 2 here, hc, you know what hc is as well. The answer is given in nanometers, 1.079 times negative 2 nanometer over nanometer. That is the same as 1.097 times 10 to positive 7 per meter. That is a perfect match with experiment. As a matter of fact, we didn't do a good job keeping sig figures. We only kept three sig figures. If you, if you give me the, 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 the values of mc squared and alpha and hc in more sig figures, we can calculate Rydberg constant in greater detail. And it turns out that uh, up to the first seven or eight sig figures, there is a perfect match between theory and experiment. With the Rydberg constant, uh, the, with the Rydberg constant calculated, and we have a complete formula for the wavelengths of the light emitted, we can now examine the energy spectrum of the hydrogen and see how it matches with the, uh, with the findings, experimental wavelengths of, uh, of the light coming out of this uh, atom. This is what's called an energy diagram. Okay, We draw different energy levels. Here's the ground state. The energy is negative 13.6 eV, as we calculated before. This is the first excited state. The energy is the ground state energy divided by 2 squared, which is 4. Here's the ground state energy divided by 3 squared. Ground state energy divided by 4 squared, and so on. Okay, that's different energy levels. As an electron jumps from higher to lower energy levels, it gives out a photon. Now we said the Baumol series was discovered first because the first four lines of the Baumol series happen to be within the visible light range. So it got noticed first. Take a look at the wavelengths of light coming from the Baumol series. This happens when an electron jumps from a higher orbital to the n equal to 2 orbital, right? So I have to use this formula. With, uh, with m equal to 2 here, that's the final uh, quantum number. The initial quantum number n is 3, 4, 5, and so on. Okay, so consider what happens with n equals 3. 
for n equal to 3, it jumps down from here to there. So this n, you plug in 3 here. So 1 over n squared is 1 over 9. You did that calculation. Hc equals 1240 eV nanometers. It's a very easy calculation. eV and eV cancel. We just was left with nanometer directly. The answer to three six figures, 656 nanometers. This is red color. Does that n number agree with experiment? Oh, yes, it does. Look, the first red line of almost here is 656.3 nanometers. The next one is n equal to 4. It's supposed to be green from here to there. Is that true? Well, plug in equal to 4 here. So 4 squared is 16. The answer is 486 nanometers, which is green colored. 486.1. That is from experiment. Okay. And the next one is blue. That's from n equal to 5 to n equal to 2. n equal to 5, so 1 over n squared is 1 over 25. The calculation gives us 434 nanometers, which is blue. The experiment, 434.1. See how, how well that matches. The next one, the purple one, 410. You can do the same calculation by using n equal to what? By using n equal to 6. Okay, so that's the first four lines of the Baumer series. There is a near perfect match between theory and experiment. In fact, we can even calculate what's called a series limit. And that corresponds to the shortest wavelengths coming out of the Baumer series. The shortest wavelengths correspond to the highest energy f of the photon. So the photon com is released when the electron goes from n equal to infinity to n equal to 2. What does n equal to infinity mean? That means the electron is very far away from the uh, the uh, nucleus, right? And that happens when a nucleus captures an electron from far away, and that electron settles down at the n equal to 2 orbital, the energy released by this electron will give you a photon whose wavelength is given by this. You just plug in n equal to infinity here. The answer is 364 nanometers. This is outside the visible light range. It's UV. So the Baumer series includes visible light as well as UV.